Um, and Pastor Brian mentioned we are in a series called Truly Free. John 8, 36 says this. So if the Son sets you free, you are truly free, which is what we want to see for every single person on planet Earth. In fact, our goal with this series is to help you position yourself so that you can experience that true freedom through Jesus. And so today we're going to talk about the topic, Freedom from Shame. And honestly, this is a topic that I take very personally. Okay, if you just woke up this morning and chose violence, let me tell you your fighting words with me. It's that God wants people to live in shame. You come at me with those words, we can knuckle up right outside, okay? Right outside those front doors, because here's what I know. Um, that is not God's desire for any one of us. And I spent many, many years with my life being ran by shame. And I think maybe I'm not the only person in here with that experience. And so shame is a very distinctive experience, um, because I know we all have those memories that we can look back on and we can laugh about. Maybe it's seemed like a massive deal in the moment, but when you talk about it now, you can like laugh with your siblings or your friends. Anyone have those memories? Yeah, one of mine uh, is when I was, I think, around 14 years old. I got to go to a Christian boy band concert, uh, and their name was Fat Chance, and it was spelled P-H-A-T. And uh, when I went to the concert, I had the privilege, I think I won the tickets, actually. And so I had the privilege of getting to meet them, and I got pictures with them. And look, they signed my CD cover. Let's go, 30s and up. Um, and so I was having the time of my life. And then I got home, and I discovered, 14-year-old me, that I had a massive rip in the back of my jeans, just massive. Just You could just see everything. And my best friend at the time, I was like, did you know that you could see everything? She said, I thought you knew. Exactly. Let me tell you, 14-year-old me did not handle that very well. It was a very big deal uh, because my choices, my chances of marrying them were much slimmer than uh, I thought. And I did not marry one of them. I actually married someone a little bit better, in my opinion. But um, yeah, we all have those moments we can look back on, we can laugh about, but then we also have those memories where not only do we not laugh about them, but we don't really want to talk about them, right? And, and, and if we're honest, we don't even want to think about it because they make us feel so shameful. We are so ashamed by those memories. And so to get us started, I actually want to read a passage that we have actually read twice in this series so far, but I want to encourage you to lean in because we are going to take a look at something brand new when we look at this passage today. And so I want to show you the first time shame is in the Bible. And so we're going to find that in Genesis chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1. And it says, and now the serpent, which is the devil, the enemy, constantly trying to steal, kill, and destroy us. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Of course we may eat the fruit in the trees of the garden. The woman, which is Eve, replied, it's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. Because God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. And so the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful, and its fruit looked delicious, and she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. And so she took some of the fruit, and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, her eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, and so I hid I was afraid because I was naked. And so let's start with the definition of shame. Here's what shame is. Brene Brown, who is a world-renowned shame researcher, she spent decades of her life studying this very topic. This is how she defines shame. 
She says, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging. That something we've experienced, done, or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. Shame is one of those things. It's a very identity warping experience. And I do say warp on purpose because it can't change your identity any more than nothing changed about Adam. He had been naked the whole time. But how he saw himself had been warped. It is an identity warping experience. And I also think it's a clever and, and even at times fatal twist on guilt. Because often we speak about shame and guilt as though they're interchangeable. But they're not. There are two very different words that mean two very different things. And so just a couple of quick distinguishing factors between guilt and shame. Guilt is action-based. And when you are living with guilt, you believe, I did something wrong. I did something bad. But shame is identity-based. And when you are in shame, you believe, I am something wrong. I am something bad. We feel guilty for what we did, but we feel shame for who we are. And we see this in different ways, different stories throughout the Bible. Another story that comes to mind, Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. So essentially this son looks at his dad and he says, dad, you're as good as dead to me and I want my inheritance now. Give me all my money, give me all my possessions, give me everything I can to make my way in this world without you. And so the father gives him his inheritance, and the son goes and he squanders it away. He parties it away. He does some really terrible, awful things for a season. And then when he's flat out broke, and he's broken, and he's ashamed of himself, the Bible says he comes to his senses. And this is, we'll pick up in verse 18. This is what he says. I will go home to my father, and I'll say, Father, I have sinned. That's the action, guilt against both heaven and you. But then we see shame here in verse 19. And then he goes, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. I don't, I don't even belong in this family anymore. That's shame because it's speaking to his identity. And in Genesis chapter 3, that passage we just read, when God asked them, where are you? And Adam says, we're hiding. He doesn't say, we're hiding because we made a mistake. He doesn't say we're hiding because we sinned. We're hiding because we made a choice and we ate the fruit that you said we shouldn't eat. He doesn't say we're hiding because of our actions. Here's what he does say. I heard you walking in the garden and I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. In other words, I saw myself in the most unfiltered sense of the word and I was ashamed of what I saw. I was ashamed of who I was. Because shame always makes us fearful. And when we become afraid, here's what we do. So let's talk about point two, what shame does. We'll keep reading in verse 11. Who told you you were naked, the Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Now what does Adam say here? Does he say, you know what? You hit it. You hit the nail on the head. That is what we did. Uh, please tell us how we can make it right. Uh, no, that's not what it does. Here's what Adam does. He says, it was the woman. It was her fault. I was just having a conversation uh, with someone who was saying that when they ask my husband to do something fun, he always says, you'll have to talk, about, you'll have to, talk to my wife about that. I was like, I think he's using me as an excuse to say no. Um, he, <laughs> this is what Adam does. He's like, it's her fault. And it's not just the woman. God, it's the woman you gave me. This is all your fault, right? So then God looks at the woman and he says, what have you done? Now, does she go, you know what? My bad. I just want to take responsibility from the very beginning. I kind of started this whole thing. Um, But God, you know what? I'm so confident in your love for me. Um, I just want to confess and just see what you want us to do about that. Is that what Eve does? No, no, no. Eve goes, it was the serpent, The serpent deceived me. That's why I ate it. In my brain, I see that Spider-Man meme where he's like, Adam's like, it's her. She's like, it's a serpent. See, listen, the serpent deceived me, and that's why I ate it. Because this is what happens. Shame makes us do two things. Shame makes us cover ourselves. We see that in verse 7. When it says they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And shame also makes us hide. 
It says, when, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Now, God only knows exactly how many years it's been since the story has taken place. But I can tell you two things that humanity has never graduated from since then is trying to cover ourselves and trying to hide. We are still trying to cover ourselves, cover up anything that makes us feel vulnerable to scrutiny. And we are still trying to hide from anything that makes us fear loss of belonging. And what I don't want to happen today, um, I don't want us to approach this topic of shame like we're reading from a textbook or like this is some theoretical, conceptual, high-level concept because this is very real, real-life stuff. If we'll put that definition back up on the screen, we all know what that feels like in our body, right? We all know what it feels like to think, I don't know if I'm worthy of belonging anymore. We all deal with that. And when we do, just like Adam and Eve, we try to cover ourselves and we try to hide. And so here's something to know about how shame operates in our lives. First thing to know, shame always leads with fear. And we see that in verse 10 when he replied, Adam replied, I heard you walking in the garden, Lord, and so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. They saw themselves in their most vulnerable state and they were afraid of what? Rejection. They were afraid to be rejected. And isn't that how it works with all of us just the same? And so we cover and we hide and we all have different ways of doing this. In fact, here are some of the different ways that we try to cover ourselves and hide because we all have our own version of these fig leaves. So one of the ways that we try to cover ourselves is with perfectionism. And we think, you are never going to tell me I'm not deserving of belonging here because I do the work. I've done the work to be my best self. I've done my work to be the best. I've done the work to earn my worthiness. Look how perfect I am, man. Look how I cross my T's and dot my I's. I never take shortcuts. I never shortchange anything. I always do it exactly right because I never want you to be able to tell me that I don't belong here. We use perfectionism. Another way that we try to cover ourselves is with defensiveness and pointing fingers. Right, this is what we see with Adam and Eve. They're pointing fingers. They think, don't look at me, look at them. It was that person. Look, I don't, I don't look at my mistakes. You, I just misunderstood. I didn't do anything wrong. You just didn't understand the whole story. You don't understand my story, my life. You don't know why I did that. You don't know what kind of home I grew up in. You don't, you don't know what I was feeling in that moment. Don't, don't look at me. Adam said, no, 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 it was the woman. And Eve literally said, he deceived me. That's why I ate it. Those were her exact words. Let's not talk about how I wanted what he was offering. Don't look at me. Look at him. Defensiveness for some of us. What we try to cover and hide with is comparison. We, are, we become extremely critical of ourselves and others. And this one goes uh, two different ways because the truth is comparison. How often do we ever see that lead to a sense of equality, right? We're never looking at someone else going, yeah, we're about the same. I think we're good. We're, um, no, 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 no. What happens? Comparison, comparison goes one of two ways. Number one, we either get a one-upper mentality, right? At least I don't fill in the blank. Man, I may not be good at X, Y, and Z, but at least I'm a hard worker. Do you know how hard they didn't work on that? How much time they didn't invest? Do you know how much help they had to get there? I mean, if I had that much help, I would get there too, right? We get that one upper mentality or we flip the coin to the other side and we have self-defeating thoughts, right? To shield ourselves from disappointment, to shield ourselves from the disappointment of maybe potentially not measuring up. Because if you never actually fully apply yourself, if you never put the full weight of your effort in it, then no one can tell you that the full weight of your effort was not enough. If you never get to know me, you'll never see how de defective that I think I am. If you never get to know me, you'll, you'll never be able to tell me that I'm not enough. You'll never reject me because you never really saw the new me, the whole me. In other words, comparison always leads to either superiority or inferiority. 
And I'm going to tell you that this one's my kryptonite, especially the inferiority one, because I was a massive people pleaser for many, many years. And then I had the revelation that I could not please everyone all the time at the same time without lying myself into so many circles I couldn't keep up. And so what did I do? I swung the pendulum, okay? I'm not, I'm not going to overcommit and underdeliver anymore. I'm never going to commit. I'm not going to say yes to anything. I'm not going to get close with anyone. I'm not going to let anyone get to know me. I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to distance myself, and I'm going to say no to everything because I can never drop the ball. If you never experience me in all my fullness, that is what I dealt with for many, many years. And I know these are just a few of the different ways that we try to cover and hide. Maybe you deal with something different. Maybe you deal with one of these chronically, or maybe you have a rotation. But here's what's true for all of us. Covering and hiding never heals our shame. It might turn the volume down a little bit. You might even mute it. You might be so good at your preferred method of covering it up that you don't even remember what it feels like to be shamed. You may not even remember because you're so good at muting it. You might go a couple of weeks or even a couple of months with it lying dormant in your system until you slip up. And then what happens? We start the cycle all over again because covering and hiding, it never actually heals your shame. What it actually does is it keeps you from healing your shame. Because as long as we content ourselves with the counterfeit, we'll never find the real solution. So if covering and hiding prevent healing, then how do we experience healing? What's the remedy? How do we heal from shame? And the good news is freedom from shame is absolutely accessible to each and every one of us. We are just one or a couple choices away from experiencing he- healing from shame. And so here's point three, some choices we can make to heal from shame. And here's choice number one. For some of us, we need to make the choice to confess where there has been true guilt, where we have actually done something wrong. For some of us, we just need to simply own that and confess Now, guilt is not shame. We've already established that. But I can say with confidence that unconfessed guilt over time leads to shame. And we have experienced that. Maybe you do something wrong. Maybe you make a mistake. And so you are afraid. You don't want to say anything. You kind of sweep it under the rug, right? And then maybe a little bit down the road, because it was never addressed, you never had that accountability, maybe you do it again, right? And then the, then the spiral thoughts begin, and you think, oh, what kind of person does that? I have this issue, this defective issue, and I keep making the same mistake, and I can't fix myself. And then down and down we go in that spiral. For some of us, maybe your thoughts sound more like, I'm not new to this Jesus thing. Right? I've been a follower of Jesus for months, years, decades, and I shouldn't still be dealing with this. What is wrong with me? There is something defective in me that I cannot perfect this area of myself. And so we just spiral and we start to meditate on our own perceived dysfunction. And we even saw this with the prodigal son in verse 18. He starts off and he's just confessing guilt, right? He's confessing action. He says, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. But he had been away for so long. And he's like, ugh, dad, I cannot even begin to tell you the choices I've made, the mistakes I've made, the lives I've ruined, the homes I've broken up. You can't even begin to imagine what an awful person I am. And so he starts with I have sinned, but then he very quickly gets to, I am no longer even worthy to be called your son. From guilt to shame because of unconfessed sin. But here's what's awesome. Here is the heart of God, James 5.16. James says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And I know firsthand, confession is scary. It is vulnerable. It is uncomfortable. It can leave you feeling like you are delivering yourself on a platter to be rejected to your face. 
Confession is terrifying, but what I can also tell you from experience is there is so much freedom and healing on the other side of confession. I remember um, many, many years ago, uh, when I first started working for Pastor Brian, we worked in this um, organization. It was my first full-time job out of college. It was in ministry. It was a dream. And I was like, what am I doing here? I don't belong. Um, and I truly, like, for the first year or two was like, I think he, I think he thought I was someone else. Like, I don't know why he hired me. I don't, I'm not good enough to be here. And so I read a ton of leadership books and I listened to a ton of leadership podcasts. And I remember I was in the car headed to work. I was listening to this podcast on trustworthiness. And he gave a few questions you could ask yourself um, to help yourself grow in that topic. And so one of the things he talked about is, can you be trusted with these small things? Can you be trusted to confess, to say something maybe that's uncomfortable, a mistake that you made to your boss to the extent that they're not surprised by it, to the extent where they're not being blindsided by that reality from someone else or from another experience. And he talked about a very practical example do you tell your boss when you're running, running late ahead of time? Now, shocker, shocker, I was running late when I was listening to this podcast. And I had a habit of, of running late. I will say uh, time management is not a natural gift of the spirit for me. And um, so I was running late, and I had this feeling, oh, I need to tell Brian I'm running late. Because what I had done before is I just tried to, like, slide into my desk like I just came from the bathroom, you know. Here's the deal. My desk was right outside his door. I wasn't fooling anybody, okay. He wasn't like, oh, you've been here the whole time. I just didn't notice, okay. But in my mind, I was trying to hide. I was trying to cover up something that I was like, ugh, I'm embarrassed about this, right. So I was like, okay. I need to text him. I truly thought I was going to get fired because here's the other thing that shame does. It overinflates your sense of what a terrible person you are. Have you ever been fired for being five minutes late? I haven't. And I've been a lot later than that. Um, so I text Brian and I'm like mortified. And let me tell you what he texts me back. It was one text, one word, all caps. Grace. That was not what I was expecting. Man, I tell you, I had all these ways that I was going to make up for my tardiness. I was going to be early for the next three days. I was going to ask him if he wanted coffee, so there was a reason I was running late. I had a whole way that I was going to make up for my perceived failure of a person. But when he sent me that text, everything that that need to compensate, it literally disintegrated in an instant. Because I confessed, I experienced instant forgiveness. And then there was nowhere for those shame spiral thoughts to go because I knew I was already confident that my belonging wasn't on the line. There is so much freedom and power on the other side of confession. And let me tell you what that did for my formerly lying self. Number one, it gave me courage to confess in the future. But number two, I mean, I'm telling you, I never breathed so deeply in my life as when I read that text and experienced the nature and character of God in that moment. That's the first choice we have to make is the choice to confess. Here's the second choice. You have to make the choice to agree with God. You know what shame is? Shame is you and I in the seat of the judge judging ourselves unworthy. It is you and I telling God, I know more about my value than you do. I know that you say I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, but I don't think you have any clue the awful things that I'm capable of and the awful things that I have done. God, I absolutely know more about my worthiness than you do. Because here's the biggest issue with shame. You are believing something about yourself that God does not, which means you are effectively calling God a liar. And I, I want to I, I make sure that you hear my heart here because I, I know there's like a pendulum here, right? And I don't want you to think this is some 
fluffy theology where I'm saying there are no consequences to your actions. Your actions don't matter. I'm not saying you don't have problems. I'm not saying you don't have areas where you need to repent and grow. I'm not saying you don't need to work on your time management skills. I am preaching to myself right now. Here's what I am saying, that according to God, your worthiness and belonging are not predicated upon you improving those things first. And you don't even have to take that from me. Listen to this verse in Titus 3, 5. It says he saved us, what? Because we got ourselves together. Is that what he says? Does it say he saved us because we got most improved Christian this year? Nope. Here's what it says. He saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. Do you know why you're worthy? Do you know why you are worthy of belonging and connection? Because Jesus said you're worthy. Because Jesus deemed you worthy. Listen, if you want to experience true, lasting freedom from shame, you are going to have to make the choice to agree with God about yourself. Here's the last choice. You have to make the choice to get to the cross. Now, I'm about to read a passage of scripture, and if you've spent any amount of time in or around church, the chances are you have heard this before. But I want to encourage you to take a different approach here, okay? I want you to hear this, and I don't want you to hear this through the filter of, I'm listening to the Bible. Because when the man who wrote this spoke these words, he was not trying to make sure he was writing a passage of scripture. He was just a dude talking to people about his life. These words that I'm about to read, they're the words of a man who had more regret than anybody you've ever known, read about, anything. These are the words of a man who carried more guilt and more regret than literally everybody in this room and maybe in the room where you're watching, all of it combined. These words were not theory for him. These words were not Christianese for him. These are the words of a man whose life experience has left him so utterly broken and guilty and brutally ashamed because this man was Saul of Tarsus, who was arrested, who arrested, sorry, tortured and imprisoned and executed innocent men and women in the name of God many of whom were the family members of the people that he would soon come to call brothers and sisters in Christ. We can't even begin to wrap our minds around the amount of regret that he had. But he didn't shove his story under a rug. He didn't try to hide it. He didn't deny it. He didn't point fingers. He didn't say, but look at them. Look at what they made me do. And you know what? He didn't even become defined by it. This is what he wrote to Christians to you and to me, this is what he said. He said, therefore, there is now no condemnation at all for those who are in Christ Jesus. He's saying there is a, there is a space, there's a place in existence where your past choices, they're known and yet you're not condemned. There is a place where what you have done, it is very clear. And yet you're still not rejected for having done it. And where is that space? It is in Christ Jesus. In that space, we were willing to confess the truth about ourselves and our choices and the fact that we have fallen short of the glory of God. In that space where we, we choose to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus, there's no condemnation in that space. Why? Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And what is the law of sin and death? The law of sin and death is what says that when you sin, you're stuck. You're just guilty. And you're guilty forever and there's nothing you can do about it. You can grovel in it. You can try to deny it. But you're always going to be stuck. 
and shame is always going to be the boss of you. That's the law of sin and death. But verse 3, for what the law was powerless to do, because the law can't fix you. The law isn't going to restore you. It's not going to set you free. Simply knowing that you're guilty, has that ever made you feel better about yourself? It never does. It always makes us feel worse, which is why we work so hard to try to cover and hide so that we don't have to feel the badness of feeling like we've messed up. The law is the bullhorn guy that says you're never going to measure up. But here is the great news, and it is great news. What the law was powerless to do, God did. Your shame is not the end of your story. And here's what I think is so cool. After all is said and done in this whole passage with Adam and Eve, I feel like the the nature and the character of God is so clearly displayed in verse 21. It says, the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. Because what their fig leaves were powerless to do They weren't going to protect them. They weren't going to cover them. I could cover myself with all of these and the wind could just blow it away. I wouldn't be protected from the elements. I wouldn't be safe from sickness. No, 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 no. What our fig leaves were powerless to do, God did. What your perfectionism was powerless to do, God did. What your deflection is powerless to do, God did. What your constant obsession with comparison to try to make yourself and convince yourself that you measure up, what that is powerless to do, God already did. He says, I see you and I know the whole truth about you. But you know what? I don't condemn you. You have made mistakes, I know but you are not a mistake. Absolutely not. He looks at us and he says, are you having a hard time forgiving yourself? Let me tell you something. You're already forgiven by the most perfect being in the entire universe. See, when I see you, even though I'm aware of the choices, the actions, the ways you've fallen short, when I see you, I don't see that. And you know what? I don't want you to see that either. I want you to see what I see when I look at you. Val, Mitch, if you'll go ahead and come up, I want to show you what I think God sees. In Colossians 3.3, it says this. It says, for you died and your life is now hidden in with Christ in God. Here's what I think God sees. He looks at us. This is us. And this is Christ. Scoot up a little bit. And God looks at us and he says, I see that you're covered, right? In your choices, in your experience, your story, your life. I see it all. I see the good things you've done. And I also see the mistakes you've made. I see where you've fallen short. I see where you look at yourself and think, I'm naked. I see that. But in this passage, he says, you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Here's what God sees. This is Christ. He says, when you choose to be with me, when I look at you, this is what I see. I see Jesus. I see the blood of Jesus that has washed you clean. I see hope for your future. I see redemption. I see wholeness. I see healing. When I look at you and I know your whole story, I see Jesus. Thank you guys so much. He says, I know, I know the whole story. I know the whole thing, but I never asked you to be perfect. I asked you to be with me. I asked you to be in me. And so we're going to take some time. We're going to take the next few minutes. We're going to take some time to intentionally respond to what God is speaking to every single one of us. 
We're going to put the different ways you can do that on the screen. I'll talk through those in just a minute. If you're serving in any of those areas, please go ahead and get to where you need to be. But we have five different ways um, that our team has facilitated for you to respond and obey to what God's asking of you. For some of you, you are here and you know, you know what I'm talking about when I talk about being just drowning in shame. And you know that you are not in Jesus yet. And so you don't have that, that, you know, freedom that comes from knowing when, when God looks at me, he doesn't see Jesus yet. So for some of you, what you need to do today is make the choice to follow Jesus. You can do that at those bistros in the back. For some of you, and I feel it's so heavy on my heart today, that some of you have been hiding from God, that you haven't talked to him, you've stopped praying, you've stopped reading your Bible because you are so ashamed and you think he's ashamed of you too. I think some of you need to go, you need to participate in communion and you just need to talk to God and let him talk to you and tell you how much he misses you. For some of you, you need to experience James 5, 6, where you confess and then you experience healing as someone else prays for you. There's our teams aligned all along both walls. You can go pray with anyone. Maybe you just need to say some things out loud so that you are not the only one carrying your secrets anymore. Maybe for some of you, you need to pray for people who are far from God, who you know are steeped in shame because they are just far from Jesus. For some of you, what you need to do is you just need to stand or maybe sit or kneel and just experience the presence of God and worship and connect with him. But whatever that looks like for you, here's what I would ask. I would ask for 100% participation in the room, that everyone in this room is going to respond in one of five ways. And so I want to invite you to go ahead and stand up. You can bow your heads and close your eyes and we're going to pray together. And I want you to ask God, God, what are you saying to me? What does my response need to be as a result of this message? And God, right now I ask every person on the other side of my voice, God, I ask that you would give them ears to hear you, God. Would you make it so clear what their next step is going to be, God? And then not only that, would you not stop there with your generous wisdom? God, I ask that you would give them courage to do exactly what you're asking them to do, God. We are so thankful for your presence. We thank you that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.